Hi, I'm Satori Shakur. Here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. The history behind one of the most iconic bakery and ice cream shops in Detroit. Plus, Detroit designs the world. The impact of Manuru Yamasaki on Detroit's signature buildings and Detroit filmmaker Ken Legend Williams on his movie Asbury Park. It's all ahead this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Esselford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Hi, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm Satori Shakur. Thanks for joining me here at the gallery at Brewery Park. This gallery was created in 2021 when Eric Walters, Brewery Park's Director of Procurement, reached out to abstract expressionist Amanda Koss to create an exhibition for the building. We're so excited to showcase this facility as a new place for artists to exhibit their works for free in the city. Let's get into the show. Coming up, we'll explore the design legacy of Minoru Yamasaki right here in Detroit and his influence around the world. Then Asbury Park by Detroit filmmaker Ken Legend Williams. He tells Stephen Henderson how the movie explores mental illness and police brutality and it was all filmed right here in Detroit. But today we're starting with dessert. Detroit Saunders Bakery and Ice Cream Shop is more than just a well-known place for great sweets. This segment from our documentary, Detroit Remember When, made in the Motor City, covers Sanders Bakery and Ice Cream Shop's history and the influence it had on the workforce and culture in Detroit. If we acted up in Montgomery Wards while my mom was shopping, we didn't get across the street to Sanders. And, uh, you know, Sanders was a real big deal with my parents. And once in a while, if you're really good, you can go to one. Sanders, what's well, always, for me, it's Sanders or Sanders. Sanders or Sanders, it doesn't matter because it's a cake is a cake. Detroit's premier cake and candy maker had stores and lunch counters all over Metro Detroit, reaching its peak in the 1960s. Mom worked, uh, one of the jobs she had was at Sanders Bakery on Woodward Avenue in Highland Park. The biggest treat we would have would be to go pick her up from work and we'd get there early. They had this double chocolate cake that was like to die for. I remember skipping high school at Notre Dame High School, don't tell the priest that, but I did because I'd walk over to Eastland Mall and go to the Saunders and get the chocolate malts, which were so fantastic over there. They're still fantastic today, but then it just seemed better when you skip school to do it. And to think a guy named Fred started it all 140 years ago. His real name is Fred Sanders Schmidt. He didn't want to be a baker because his father was a great baker and he didn't want to compete with him. The story really begins in Chicago, where Fred, born in Germany, grew up. As a young man, he traveled back to Europe to train as a master confectioner. When he came back, he started his first store in Chicago um, under Fred Sanders, so not to compete with his father. After the great fire of 1871, Fred came east and Chicago's loss was Detroit's gain. He was very successful very quick. In fact, he was a way ahead of his time. And some say he created the ice cream soda. 
he was one of the larger confectioners in the Midwest. His pavilion of sweets opened up on Woodward Avenue and became an instant Detroit landmark. His candy making machines were powered by motors that were made by Thomas Edison and repaired by a young fellow named Henry Ford. Let's say he ran a finely tuned organization. Sanders used to have a school, so if you worked in one of their ice cream parlors, they had 60 ice cream parlors at one time in the metro Detroit area, you had to go through a school. The school actually showed legions of Detroit women the proper do's and don'ts of good customer service. They were literally sent home if they weren't dressed appropriately, and they had the uniforms they had to wear. And the lunch counter became a Detroit tradition. My big, big, big day was to go downtown with my friends and go to Sanders and stand behind people's chairs three people deep while you waited for your seat. You look down the line, see who was closest to being finished, then you stand behind him, and you keep looking at him, telling him, basically, Hurry up and eat. Can you imagine trying to sit there and eat your lunch or your Sunday while people were standing behind you, but you just ignored them? In 1913, Fred created his most iconic concoction, the Bumpy Cake. He wanted to pay homage to his father before he died. His father was a great baker. He was a great confectioner. So what he did is combine the two with a ganache over a devil's food cake with buttercream, and that's how the Bumpy Cake was started. We can even give Fred's company credit for sweetest day here in Detroit. It became kind of a chocolate and gift card kind of a holiday, which is very similar to Valentine's Day, but at a different time of year. Sweetest day remains an October tradition, big right here in Detroit and in Cleveland, where it started 90 years ago. Today, some of Detroit's favorite confections are making a comeback. Morley Chocolates is rejuvenating Fred's product line and opening up stores all over again. They've also brought back the great debate. Half of the people, including my in-laws, do not, they say Saunders. You say Sanders, I say Saunders. I almost think it was a family thing. You said it the way your, your parents did. And believe me, it was Sanders, not Saunders. It's actually Saunders, I'm sure, but I say Sanders because of my folks are from Tennessee. <laughs> you know, to us, either is right. As long as you are talking about Sanders Saunders and you're a fan, we love it. You can find out more about Saunders. Just go to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. Let's stay on the treat train and talk about beer. Our documentary, Detroit Remember When, Made in the Motor City, gives us some insight into the Detroit beer scene. When you go out with your uh, friends, do you ever drink beer? Pop, Come please. on, son, be honest with me. Do you drink beer? Of course I drink beer, Pop. I'm 29 years old. If you're of a certain age and you lived in Detroit, you know about America's only fire-brewed beer. Pop, Pop, listen to me. I drink Stroh's. Honest. Son, your mother and I, we only want what's best for you. Hey, Caesar, what's with this fire-brewing business? I don't know, man. Wait a minute. <laughs> hey, Sam. Oh. Fire-brew, what is it? I'm not doing this because Stroh's is America's only fire-brewed beer. What do I know from fire-brewing? Their beer was not made in electric kettles. It, would, had, a, it had a flame underneath it, man. <laughs> and uh, that made it special. And I'm not doing it because According I to Stroh's, fire-brewing mellowed the beer, made it years. smoother. I'm doing it because I love the taste. And besides, I'm getting a lot of bread to admit it. It dates all the way back to 1909 when Julia Stroll was touring breweries in Germany. So we tasted and tested and compared. The styles of beer that he liked particularly uh, turned out to be fire brewed. They were brewed in kettles heated with a direct flame. The Stroh family had already been making beer in Detroit for half a century when the fire brewing process started. So my great-great-grandfather arrived here with uh, $200 in 1849. Well, that was, that was enough to get started. Bernard Stroh came with a wave of Germans to the Midwest, political refugees of the German Revolution of 1848. Bernard started the business in 1850, just east of downtown Detroit, off Gratiot Avenue. 
by the 1860s, he built a great big new brewery, and he was the largest brewer in Michigan by then. When Prohibition hit Michigan in 1917, Stroh's actually survived by making other things. Uh, we made soda pop, ginger ale, we had our own line of orange soda, cola, and all sorts of things, and then ice cream. Stroh's made a malt extract, supposedly for cooking and as a nutritional supplement, but, <laughs> well, we all know it was really for people who wanted to make their own illegal brew in the basement. Few brewers actually survived Prohibition, the Depression, and then the war after that, but the post-war boom was really pretty good to those who did. Pfeiffer got very big, Goebel got very big, Altus got very big. By the late 1950s, the big brand in Detroit was Goebel. Uh, Joe Bell to some. That was the spoof on it. Pabst Blue Ribbon or PBRs, and uh, <laughs> that was called Joe Bell. Joe Bell. Uh, I've heard of J.C. Penney, but uh, not uh, Joe Bell. It's football once again with Goebel 22. How's this? Van Patrick was at the mic for Goebel when the Detroit Lions won their last NFL championship back in 1957. Lions 28, Chicago 10. Back then, Van Patrick was also the voice of the Detroit Tigers. And one of his famous expressions, well, here's the pitch, it's a long one, oh, it's foul by a Goebel beer case. When Stroh's became the official beer of the Tigers, Van Patrick was suddenly out, replaced by an announcer from Baltimore, some guy named Ernie Harwell. The great brewery strike of 1958 hurt the Detroit beer business so badly it really never recovered. Beer from St. Louis and Milwaukee suddenly moved right in. Pabst became the biggest selling brand in Michigan as a consequence of that strike. In order for us to grow, we had to expand outside Michigan. Goebel went bankrupt, acquired by Stroh's. Pfeiffer moved out of state while Stroh's hired New York ad man, Bill Bernbach. Bernbach had created the iconic Volkswagen Beetle campaign, Think Small. But in the late 60s, Stroh's was thinking big. Stroh's brings you this eight pack to remind you how fast our beer disappears. The advertising worked. Oh, Yank! What about some of that Stroh's beer what you've been talking about? Stroh's quickly became a national brand, buying other beers and breweries along the way. Pick it up, mate. We don't want the blokes to know we've been here. But the costs, they were just too high. The Stroh Brewery on Gratiot shut down in 1985. So here's a toast. The first era of Detroit-made beer had come to a close. From one beloved to another, Strauss. When it comes to art and culture in Detroit, design is at the top of the list. Around the city and into the suburbs, you can find the landmarks from Albert Kanto Ilil Saarinen to Minoru Yamasaki. Yamasaki designed the World Trade Center and also left his mark here in Detroit. Here's a closer look from our Detroit public television documentary, Detroit Designs the World. We remember Yamasaki today as the, as the designer of the World Trade Center in New York, the twin towers that unfortunately were lost on 9-11. Beyond that, he was a leader in what we call mid-century modernism, which took the basic uh, efficiency of modernism, glass and steel and clean lines, and kind of infused it with some warmth and, and beauty that we associate more with something like the arts and crafts movement. Yama, uh, what we say, um, uh, softened and humanized modernism in some really important ways. So many modernists had struggled for so long before the 50s to try to create and convince people of a modern architecture that didn't rely on the past, that was of the 20th century and didn't need to use arches and, and other elements from the history. We will succeed in creating the first modern, technological, humane, prosperous civilization. Inspired by his travels, he was incorporating 
sure elements of Italian Renaissance architecture and French Gothic architecture, he was using Islamic arches and he was using the notion of the screened window from Islamic architecture. He used a lot of elements from Japanese architecture. So he didn't limit himself to the Western history like some modernists tried to. He really was a pioneer global architect. The problem was that in the mid-50s, modernism was still very strong and still very influenced towards rejecting that historical past. At the end of World War II, the Detroit firm of Smith Hinchman Grills was looking for a new chief designer and heard about this young Minoru Yamasaki in New York and hired him to come to Detroit. And I think like a lot of people who come from far away from Detroit, he probably thought he would be here for a couple of years and move on. And instead, he spent the rest of his life here. Well, Yamasaki started out with Smith Hinchman doing the first modernist building in Detroit, the Federal Reserve Building in downtown Detroit that was highly praised and much imitated. As early as 1948, he was really pushing the envelope uh, for these sleek lines and large glass windows, uh, and the annex is a beautiful example of that. People walk by every day and don't even really notice that that is one of the most famous architects in the world. He got his reputation fairly quickly here. He did schools everywhere. And then he became Wayne State University's almost in-house architect. He did their McGregor Conference Center uh, on the campus, which is one of his very best buildings. And by that time, his reputation was growing and he started doing buildings around America and around the world. McGregor is really, I think, in the architectural world considered to be his masterpiece. It's the one of the first buildings he designed after his world tour. And it goes farther, I think, than any other work that he did in terms of incorporating disparate elements and disparate influences from around the world. For instance, it has uh, elements of a Greek temple to it. It has elements of a Gothic cathedral. It has a little bit of those uh, Islamic screens that I mentioned. Pools outside the building. It's a very Japanese sort of uh, atmosphere. And he kind of brings all these different ideas together. And in the other work that he does after this, he never seems to reach out to as many different kind of influences as he did at McGregor. Plus, McGregor, I think, is just well done in terms of the details and the proportions and the relationship between the inside and the outside. In the 50s, Yama began to work on a project for the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company, which needed a new headquarters, and he created what is now known as One Woodward, a, a skyscraper. It was his first skyscraper. People don't realize this, but it, it wasn't even completed at the time that he was hired to do the World Trade Center which was going to be the world's tallest buildings. And here he had just a couple of tall building designs under his belt. But one of the things that's evident even in that building, his first skyscraper, is that he's looking for a different way to do it. The typical way of designing skyscrapers back then and constructing them was uh, you use a steel frame and you build it up as many stories as you need and then you cover it with some sort of skin, which at that point was a lot of glass and maybe a little bit of metal. And he felt like that was becoming too kind of commercial and packaged, and he wanted to find a different kind of expression. One thing that Yamasaki was always trying to do in his public buildings is to bring the public in, to have them feel comfortable, to have the, be the buildings be beautiful. I think one of the other criticisms that uh, struck me as I researched his work was the number of times that he used the word beauty in the 50s and 60s when other architects weren't. When I think about what Yamasaki gave to architecture, besides a lot of great buildings that are still there and, and will be there like McGregor, at the same time, the notion that any important public building needs to have uh, some uh, outdoor space for users, a plaza, landscaping, uh, greenways, bike paths, a sculpture garden, anything like that. That is so part of our architectural and planning DNA now that you can't conceive of an important building that would ignore that stuff. And you don't necessarily think that that's what Yamasaki gave us, but in fact, it is what he gave us. Named after a real street here in Detroit, the movie Asbury Park was created by local filmmaker Ken Legend Williams. It tells the story of four Detroit kids growing into adulthood, exploring challenges of mental illness and police brutality. 
Stephen Henderson talked with Williams on American Black Journal. Let me ask you a question. What's the first thought that goes through your mind when the police rolls up on you? Where you running, huh? Yeah, so down, bro. I hope I don't get a ticket. I hope that I make it home alive. Quite frankly, I was in fear for my life. The suspect was not compliant with our orders and was just obstructing our investigation. So sick people on the funerals there. The Civil Rights Act only resulted because of a nation of African Americans coming together and taking a stand. You people think it's okay to break the law. Uh, those of us who are from Detroit or live in the area know that Asbury Park is uh, a street on the west side. Uh, is now the title of your film, but it's also where you're from. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, grew, I, I grew up on Asbury Park uh, Street uh, right off 7 Mile. So talk about uh, the inspiration for this film, uh, the street that you grew up on, the experiences uh, that you had there. The biggest thing behind this film is survival. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, each of the kids, they have their own different things that, are, that they're going through and dealing with. And I thought it would be interesting to, to see this from a uh, kid's perspective. You know, there are so many things that are going on in the world right now with police brutality, uh, mental health awareness, um, you know, just a lot of different things. And as adults, we have a hard time grasping our heads around it and, you know, and, and dealing with it. So to be able to see this from a kid's perspective, I think is necessary, yeah. you know, because I'm a parent and I know, you know, as I watch the news and see the things that are going on, I know how I'm trying to deal with it, gravitate to it. And I think just as a community, we just have to do a better job of, you know, actually checking to see what's going on with our kids to see how they're dealing with it, to see what they think about it. Um, because I think if, if we did that, I think, we'll really be blown away by some of the responses that we get because they're not stupid. They, <laughs> right. they, they see what's going on. Talk about the differences between what maybe you experienced as a kid growing up in that area and what your characters uh, in the movie experience. Is there a, a big difference or? To, 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 to be honest, it's a direct reflection of what I experienced as a kid. Like I grew up in a single parent home. My father left when I was six years old. And when that happened, I was no longer able to be a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. I had to start moving. I always, you know, the running joke is when I was six, I was actually 16 because the level of responsibility, you know, shifted. And I was no, no longer able to be a carefree kid to just sit back and say, hey, you know, everything is okay. There were certain things that I did to try to protect the house. You know, I was the kid who I'll pull out the toolbox and something needs to get fixed. You know, I'm I'm doing that now. I'm 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 checking I'm checking the, the the windows at night and looking out to make sure you know that my mom is protected and things like that. So I took on a much older persona than I actually was due to my circumstances. Yeah. And the reality is that's not uncommon. The drug dealing and the shooting, like yeah, that happens. But I feel like this portion of it is often missed. Everybody is often, you know, trying to be tough and things like this. But what's often missed in those films is the vulnerability. I think one of my biggest motivations behind this film is my youngest son. I looked at him one day and I laughed and I was like, man, you're like really a 10 year old. Because when I was 10, I had responsibilities. I had, you know what I mean? It was just a totally different animal. And to see him just be carefree, I wasn't able to be carefree as a kid. So I wonder um, what message you think people who aren't from Detroit and who may not know anything about Asbury Park, the street, um, might take away from this. Uh, might take away from this. So I'm always curious about how we project to everybody else uh, from from the city. Asbury Park isn't that even necessarily a Detroit story. Right. Um, right. It it actually takes place in the fictitious world of. Uh, the inner city, yeah. you know, because while it is 
relevant in Detroit, it's also relevant in Baltimore and St. Louis and, you know, just all over the country. But, but I think oftentimes, like when you're going through things, because you're dealing with it in real time, you don't stop and think, hey, somebody's dealing with it over here or someone's dealing with it over there. So for me, you know, like I said, is 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 much bigger. And honestly, my goal and my hope is that people that are not from that environment will take a look and start asking questions because I feel like that's how you evoke change. Here, it's just a fight to breathe. Well, that's it this week for One Detroit Arts and Culture. Thank you so much for joining. I'd like to express my gratitude to the gallery at Brewery Park for letting us film here. See you next week and take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you.